You're listening to Just, stories about the people working to build thriving communities rooted in justice. I'm Jess Averhart, co-founder of Black Wall Street Homecoming. And I'm Rob Shields, executive director of the ReCity Network. All right, look, so here's why we're here. We're here to get proximate. We're here to listen. We're here to process. And we're here to help you process. But here's what we're not going to do. We're not going to be preachy because we don't have all the answers and we will never make you feel like an outsider. Keeping with the theme of sharing, we always want to acknowledge the whole person and that starts with our personal Personal check-in. Let's do it. All right. Well, we're back. We're back. Uh, We're back. It's like a hamster wheel, but I do know that this is episode three. That's not to assign them numbers. Who knows? Probably not. Yeah, I was just thinking about that. Like, (laughs) but I know we're in season two. Yes. (laughs) I do know that I can say that. Yeah, it is good to be back and start my morning. I don't know that our listeners know this, but we typically will record early in the morning, so it's nice to start the day off this way. So it's been a week. How have you? How have you been? How's the week going? I know you're heading into school season and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. all these things. What's cooking, friend? Yeah. Well, it's cook. It's cooking. Life's cooking, right? It's not slowing down. I think I find myself really excited for fall, right? You're a big fan. You're a big fan of fall. And I think for a number of reasons, mostly just because any change at this point is so refreshing. Jess, I'm not even kidding. I get so excited to go check the mail these days. I'm like, <laughs> Oh man, I get to go walk outside and walk down my driveway and see what mail I have today because that is like a, it's a change of pace. So it's a quiet walk because it, you know, it's kind of crazy inside my house. So needless to say, I'm super excited for the weather. If I'm excited for the mail, then yeah, Weather's the weather changing, getting a little colder. And just with COVID, you know, just any, anything to break up the monotony of what this is now that, especially when we know that this is, doesn't look like it's going away. So it's just trying to celebrate the small changes, however small they may be. On my good days, I'm staying in that mentality, it, you know, between everything that's going on in the news and it's a daily battle to look at your day through the right lens, right? And I think that even in moment by moment, just you feel yourself the tug of answering the question, how are you doing? And mm-hmm. you could just easily rattle off the 10 worst things about your life, right? Or the 10 worst things about the world. And if you're not careful, that can you have to face those things. And that's what this podcast is about, right? Leaning into the difficulty and leaning into injustice. but I think we talked about this in previous episodes of you have to counterbalance that with taking care of yourself and trying to find ways to be positive or ways to celebrate in your life whenever you can. That's the fight I'm fighting right now. It's hard to do. I'll be honest. I don't win at it most days, but I'm, I'm trying. It's good practice though. We got to just stay sort of mindful, right? You can't sit on the sidelines right now of your life, even though it's tempting and we feel like we've all been sidelined. The truth is is just different. So you got to participate in the day and figure out what your day looks like, regardless of how it might appear. Otherwise, it can get a little maddening. So I uh, shared with the listeners last week that that I was doing 75 hard. It's exactly what I just described. It's sort of like participating in life, not accepting that we've been sidelined. And I'm on day 10. Today was day 10. There we go. There we go. Double digits. Yeah, that's what I said today when I did my post. I was like, I'm finally in double digits. <laughs> <laughs> so excited. Yeah, so I just, I finished that before getting ready to do this. The premise is you do two 45-minute workouts a day. And I think I shared with people a gallon of water, two 45-minute mm-hmm. workouts, and then read and various things. So this was my first of two, which will be great. And then this afternoon, I might do something with kettlebells. Oh, man. Okay. Doing, doing some kettlebell workouts. I've been enjoying them, but they work because my body hurts. So I guess that's good. It's a good, it's a good hurt though, right? There's like a, there's, yeah. there's definitely a good hurt to working yeah. out where you're oh, like, man, yeah. I, I, I enjoy this, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It is. It feels like I did something. Is your, now that you're 10 straight days in, I always, when I do workouts, especially if I'm like starting something new, it doesn't yeah. hit me the next day or even that day. It hits me like the third day. Like, what, yeah. are, are you still, is it starting to catch up to you or when, yeah. when does that hurt come in? My day two is the absolute worst. Like, oh. day, so like the, okay, so it is the third day. So the first day is the workout. Second day is like pain. Then the, so it is. <laughs> third day is like, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> the day, like, what have I done? I mean, right. that makes you want to turn it off and be like, never mind. Why did there's I no, do this? This is terrible. It's so weird that that's how our bodies work. Like, there's no greater feeling than like to start a workout 
on day one, you're like, wait, this isn't that bad. I can do this. I can do this for 75 days, right? Like, and then <laughs> then day two and day three come, you're like, oh, it's catching up to me a little bit. Right. And the fitness experts, what do they say? You got to work through it. Work, <laughs> you got to do a workout. That'll get you through the pain. And you're just like, somehow this is counterintuitive to my logic of my whole life. So <laughs> I'm feeling like, no, I'm going to go <laughs> lay down. <laughs> right. Like, yeah. no, go run. Like, I can't move my leg. Anyways. <laughs> Well, I'm looking forward to uh, our guests today. Guests, plural. We're going to yeah. set a record today in most amount of guests ever hosted at one time. We've done different episodes in different ways and different structures, but uh, today is going to be a party where I even test the social distancing guidelines on Zoom. I don't know what the rules are for how many people you can have on Zoom. It's oh my not gosh, like Brady Bunch. That's right. It will almost fill up the grid a little bit. But I think this concept of neighboring, we're going to lean into today. What does it look like to love my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? These are pretty profound questions that have really practical answers to them. And I think it'll be really good for us to wade into these waters, especially as we are you know, coming up on a really divisive season. Anytime there's an election going, on can get very tribal very quickly. And it feels like we've been in that place for a while now. But asking this question of who is my neighbor and how does that transcend maybe some of the, the silos or the tribal lines that we have drawn for ourselves, I think it'll be a really good conversation. And I think especially how necessary that work is to redefine who, the na- who our neighbor is and how we engage them. Because if you turn on the news right now, you're hit all over again with this idea that things don't seem to be changing. Injustice doesn't seem to be going away. And I don't have all the answers, but I definitely know that we're not going to figure it out if we we continue to be fragmented and continue to be divided. And that's kind of how you keep the status quo in place is when we all just find ways to separate from each other versus leaning in. I don't have all those answers, but I think it's going to be a really good conversation today with our guests. All right. Well, without further ado, let's dive in. Would love to welcome onto the show the co-hosts of the Who Is My Neighbor podcast, Reynolds Chapman, Tammy Rodman, and Keith Daniel. Can you hear us loud and clear on your end? Yes, yes. yes good morning. Good to be with you. Good morning. Welcome, welcome. We're thankful that you would carve out the time with us today. Excited to have our listeners learn more about the work that you're doing with the organization you represent in Durham Cares, but but also this new medium that you're leaning into during the pandemic with this podcast. And so I'll just cue it up for our listeners. For those of you who don't know, this is a, a brand new podcast by one of our, our oldest partners here at ReCity, Durham Cares. And the premise of the podcast is really, I think, timely for this current moment and season that we find ourselves in. And so the first season, this inaugural season, focuses on the present moment and how do we love our neighbors amid a pandemic and a history of racial injustice, which is, I think, a really powerful question for us to consider. And I think one I'm looking forward for Keith, Tammy, and Reynolds to kind of elaborate on. So Keith, Tammy, Reynolds, let's just jump straight into this. Why this podcast and why now? Yeah, well, I can start on that since I kind of pulled Tammy and Keith into it. We've been thinking about doing a podcast for a while now, and we've had some important programming that we've been working on that has put the podcast on the back burner. And this summer, actually, one of our interns in his kind of story that he shared before coming onto our team shared that he creates podcasts. His name's Christian DuPont, and he's a Duke Divinity field education intern. And I thought, wow, this is a great opportunity for us to do what we've wanted to to do for a while. At Durham Cares, we really emphasize the importance of stories and storytelling. So we thought that a podcast could be a really great medium for sharing a lot of the stories from the pilgrimage that we do, the Durham Pilgrimage of Pain and Hope, stories from the communities where we work. And so that's why we've wanted to do a podcast for so long. But when Christian joined the team, here was somebody who could do all the technical work for it, and he did a remarkable job with it. So we decided to dive in. In terms of the topic, why we decided to focus on the history of racial injustice and the pandemic is just because people are looking for ways to navigate what's going on. And this is the work that we've been doing for a number of years. And so we thought we could elevate some important stories to help people uh, on that journey. That's great. That's a clear why. So I admire how you move and navigate your days how you think about the impact that you'll have on the community. And so I'm fascinated by this 
next step in your work around this podcast and this idea of who is my neighbor. So when you're thinking about the stories that you've heard, the conversations that you had, does any one of those conversations sort of stand out, particularly because you are so connected to your community? I suspect that conversations that live and speak to you will be ones that will be really powerful for our listeners. Are there any specific stories that really just resonate with you even this morning? I think one of the most impactful conversations for me was the conversation that we had with Yvonne Almonte and Miriam. The timing of it, I think it was a perfect time because Yvonne does a lot of street ministry in the Hispanic Latino community. And I had heard a bit of his story before, but just to understand the struggle, and that is kind of my passion because I came before Durham Cares, I also had a ministry in which I housed people and fed people. So that one really stuck with me when he basically was crying for help. (laughs) And, you know, he was sharing the stories, but in that was a cry for help for the community who was suffering or is still suffering with COVID, with the numbers. And so that one really, that really hit home to the point that it compelled me to actually forward the podcast to someone I knew. So yeah, that one probably stood out. And the one on education. Those are two areas that are very important to me. When we talked to Javanya Lewis, and it was a young lady, I can't remember her name right now, and her daughter. And they were just sharing about Durham Public Schools and some of the issues that have been revealed, issues that have been there all along. (laughs) But it seems like they were heightened when COVID came. Those two stood out for me. For those of our listeners who may not be as aware, I mean, they should go and, and listen to that specific episode or both of those episodes that Tammy yes, referring yes, to. But yes. the numbers that Tammy refers to is most recent data available for that episode where that 75% of all COVID cases in Durham County were yes. in the Hispanic community. And mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. it's obviously way over proportionate or disproportionate representation of, of how many people make up the Hispanic community in Durham. And so just a really, really devastating statistics on who is being affected and why. And just like you said, this word reveal, right? Because both with COVID and with the education system, so much of this pandemic is revealing things that were already oh, true, yeah. right? Or exacerbating old truths, not, not creating necessarily new problems, although COVID is a new problem. There's so many old problems that it really is bringing to the surface that are, are really painful, but we, we can't look away. We have to lean in. I would encourage our listeners to dive in, listen to those stories, and just educate yourself on how this is affecting different neighbors differently. Keith, I'm wondering that question for you too. And from your perspective, things that have really resonated with you. I love Reynolds talks about just storytelling as the impetus, right? I mean, you could say you're journalists, but probably not. You could say you're storytellers. Yes. In many ways, activists. Okay. Potentially like, but there's, there's a lot to this, especially when you start to dig into community and you ask leadership and members of community to talk about their experience. What has resonated for you in doing this podcast? Well, I want to begin with gratitude for you all for having us on to to reflect um, again publicly about the importance of hearing from our neighbors who we care about. The times we live in now demand, especially given the pandemic, the injustice, the racial upheaval. I mean, even getting up this morning again, given the uh, the most recent shooting of another black man who apparently you know was turning away, he's got his children in his car. You know, I almost didn't get out of bed. Uh, Also had a family member, 15 year old young man who was shot here in Durham two nights ago. And so, you know, breathing is real, right? It's being able to, when you're, when you're so proximate as we are as people of color, and it brings us back to a place of um, reckoning about our humanity and figuring our way out of these horrors, right? It's horrifying. You know, when you ask the question of people who've been on the show or the show's episodes, I mean, they all have been deeply impactful to me because for, I guess, reasons that I will know on the other side, um, I'm increasingly burdened by other people's pain and reckoning with what it means to come alongside, to be with. You know, there's this ethics of theological, ethical theory and application that means that there is a way to walk with people alongside, even when the answers aren't readily available to us. And I think what we experience in the podcast is I think about Miriam in particular, who works with us at Durham Cares, who experienced COVID herself and recently, you know, lost her father last year. I mean, 
when your humanity comes knocking at your door, I mean, unfortunately, sometimes that's when when people will respond. And I think what we're trying to compassionately do is is to say to folks that our neighbors are closer than we think. And and it doesn't have to be, you know, till it hits my household before I can I can participate in moving closer and moving more justly and acting more justly and being humble about the fragility of life. Uh, my friend Lafayette was on the show and that was personally gratifying for me because Lafayette is not leading an organization or an executive director. He is a person who's grown up all his life in Durham and has encountered all of the valleys and the peaks of a place like Durham. And just a chance to be vulnerable with him, but also mindful of like what it means to kind of open up your story for people was really life giving to me. And yeah, it's it's worth us pressing into these difficult questions. I mean, some people are using the language of courageous conversations and brave space, creating brave space is another language a friend of mine who does justice work has written a poem about. So, you know, I try to show up each morning with a, a heart for that, even though, like I said, it's hard to get up given what we're facing every day. I listened to some of the convention last night, trying to honestly reckon with the divergent perspectives people have on what's going on. And so, yeah, the podcast has been a been a gift to hear from, you know, Virginia Williams as she re-narrated what it was like for her at the age of, what, 20 or 19, 20 years old to sit in at an ice cream counter and demand her humanity, you know, and the inspiration that she gave too. So, yeah, a lot of emotions. Uh, it's, it's a very much a roller coaster ride right now, but the, the podcast has given us some real clarity around how we can still get through it together. Yeah, I appreciate you having the courage to be on this call. I mean, you talk about just the wrestling and how real it is to to grapple with these things. This is not something you do at a distance. And that's what I've always respected about you, Keith, is you lean in and you you recognize the humanity of all of your neighbors, but that comes at a cost. It comes at a personal cost to kind of bear those those burdens. I want to ask you guys, when you ask the question, who is my neighbor? I think it implies that maybe you're providing an answer that is a little countercultural and how you define who is my neighbor. So unless you're saving that one for the last episode, right? <laughs> I don't want to make you spoil it, but would you just for our listeners, dive in a little bit into how you define who is my neighbor. I'll share a little bit about that. One of the things that is foundational to Durham Cares is that we were birthed out of the story of the Good Samaritan. And that's where the concept, uh, the question, who is my neighbor comes from. And the way that Jesus responds to the teacher of the law, his question, is not the way that he wants Jesus to respond. He wants to know what he can do to inherit eternal life. And when Jesus tells him the story, he kind of flips it around and he says, I'm not going to focus on all the good things that you can do. I want you to learn how to be a neighbor from the last person that you would even consider learning from. So he tells the story of a Samaritan, this religious outsider who the teacher of the law has kind of disparaged and would not trust to be a teacher of how to be a good neighbor. And so I think that one of the things that that story tells us is that there's so many people who can be our teachers about what it looks like to be a good neighbor, who we can learn from. And I think that all the work that we do at Durham Cares is to elevate those stories of people who can show us what it looks like to be a neighbor. So there's no clear answer. It's not like, here, follow these five steps and you will be a good neighbor. But I think that there's a real importance to who teaches us what it looks like to be a neighbor. That's great. Tammy, did you want to share? Did you want to offer something? Just, you know, the, the realization, and I think Keith touched on it a little bit. When you hear people's stories, that helps you to look in someone's eyes and see the humanity in them and to realize that we are all neighbors. We're all connected. And that defines it. Like I say, it's no clear step by step. Just realizing people's humanity and accepting. You might not agree with everything people do, but that is a human being that you're looking at and that you're hearing and understanding that pain, that person who's suffering in whatever ways they may be suffering. So just wanted to add that. 
I so appreciate that. And I think I, the approach of storytelling is so, can be so disarming because mm-hmm. you quickly, whether it's acknowledged out loud or if it's just something that you recognize internally, you are f- mirrored with your biases oftentimes once a story unfolds. As soon as a story unfolds, a person and their reality becomes tangible. Like you can touch it, feel it. You own it too. I love what Keith said, opening up your story that people are willing to open up their story and be vulnerable and gift it to someone else. So through this podcast, it's a gift of other people's stories. So I I just really love the platform and how you're telling the community about neighboring through the eyes and through the framework of people's lived experiences. That's really a beautiful thing. And it also, like I said, can be a reckoning too around your own personal biases once you feel more connected to that person. So what do you, what gives you hope about this work? What's the what here? I'm trying to get back to this why here. Like, what is your hope for the podcast? And I'm talking about for your listeners. I hope that the listeners will gain hope. When you listen to someone else's struggle, hopefully you can begin to see one, their humanity, but just have a desire to get past your biases to learn them, like you say, embrace what they are, understand what they are, and to just be able to begin to listen. That is the inroad. That is the step. I think when Rob mentioned earlier, that is a step. When you listen to someone else's story and say, okay, I can't maybe fix it, but what can I do? What can I do within myself first and foremost? And then maybe what can I do in the community? How can I help? And is this the step for me? So that is what I hope for the listeners, that they get a better understanding just outside of their bubble. (laughs) That's that's fair. I think that's a valiant sort of goal for your listeners, truly. I mean, particularly now with with everything being so fragmented, that's a great, great objective. Keith, do you want to share what, what are your hopes for the podcast and for your listeners? I read a quote recently that said, it doesn't really matter that no one understands you. It just matters that there's someone who wants to. Hmm. What is it like to live in a community where you feel isolated and no one really cares? It's a that it's not rocket science. It's like I know my friend Wanda Boone from Durham Tribe likes to say everybody needs at least one raving fan. Somebody when you're on their mind when they get up in the morning and I am just overwhelmed by the gift of that here in Durham, that there are people who think about me and my story in particular and want to know how I'm doing. I mean, how are you doing in the pandemic? It's a simple, it's a question that can be life-giving if the person is not just saying it like we do typically when we're busy on the street passing by getting to our next appointment, right? So if there is a big silver lining, which sometimes can be hard to see in times like these, is that we you do see people come out and say, help me, help me understand, help me understand what you're experiencing. Often when we're on the, on the episode, our guests will say something and I'm like, now see, now I just want to sit in silence with that for like mm. five minutes, but we're on a podcast, so we got to go on to the next question, right? Mm. Yeah. So for me, I just hope, you know, listeners and hearers will, will say, yeah, I, I can't, no one can wake up at any moment and say, There's absolutely nobody who cares about my situation, even though, again, the evidence might be preponderously against that, whether it's because of the political environment, you know, the city government is not really listening to the community when it comes to housing issue or the needs of the community. And and then we get people on the show and they're like, no, we we have some testimonials here where there are people who really do care and are actually trying to do something about it. As hard as it is at times to feel like you can do much, but Mm. that shouldn't stop us. So I think that's the inspiration that I hope. I think that's such an important concept that you talk about, Keith, is, and in quoting Wanda's work with Durham Tribe of this, mm-hmm. everyone needs a raving fan in their corner, right? We all, we all feel that, you know, we all can think of the person in our corner that just, we know just loves us, rooting for us, and this the empathy that we have or, uh, or that we're receiving from them, right? And I think tying to what, Tammy, you said earlier, just listening to someone's story requires you getting proximate, which is something we talk about a lot on this show. Just you got to lean in, you got to get proximate to, to listen. And I think that proximity often, not necessarily, but is what sets us up to be able to then gain empathy for how their story is different than ours, how it, how it can intersect with ours. I ran across an article in the New York Times right when the pandemic had just been about a month or two in. This is back in April. And it talked about these seemingly contradictory notions that the pandemic had increased Americans' feeling of solidarity with each other. 
But at the same time, it also had increased their acceptance of inequalities due to luck. It said this increase in solidarity has the potential to bolster unity among Americans and sharpen the focus on more vulnerable groups, but at the same time could increase the acceptance of those inequalities and undermine the efforts to help these groups reduce those inequalities. So it's this nuanced notion, but this idea that how the pandemic might feel a kind of this, this illusion of, hey, we're all in this together, but also your podcast leans into this history of injustice and, and tackles how that plays out in this present day. If we're not careful, the pandemic can also breed complacency of, well, I'm lucky they're not, so we're not really going to do anything to change it. And I think that that's why I love so much the pattern that you have laid out here of this proximity that breeds empathy, but not empathy just for its own sake, but empathy to then take that into action to say, if I'm expanding the tent of who my neighbor is, and I start to become this raving fan of other people whose experience is different than mine, and they're experiencing injustice, then my action as a neighbor is to do something about it. Just like you mentioned, Reynolds, it's not enough to just be a good... The reason the Samaritan was called good wasn't that he just felt empathy and he just kept going. He felt empathy for the cultural other, the racial other, the ethnic other, and he did something about it. He took a step to actually address the injustice that that person was victim to. He was also the only one of the three people in the story who went to the other side of the road and got proximate. So to speak to your proximity point, the other two passed by on the opposite side of the road. Mm -hmm. There it is. There it is. And I think one of the challenges, you know, I've heard of other podcasts that have taken on more deliberate efforts to reach out to the ones who go around, right? The ones who choose not to engage. And how do we regard them? Some people look at the church today and it, it breaks my heart. And they say, basically, all pastors are just performers behind the pulpit. And I know some who are not. But, you know, I, I get it when the community is disillusioned with the expectations that, that folks who, who claim a faith disposition or maybe don't, but actually aren't really, you know, ready to go that extra mile, so to speak, another biblical imagination of what it looks like to, to offer a level of sacrifice or be subject to suffering of the other. I'm reminded that's no easy thing. So my compassion, too, is towards my neighbor who is the one who is avoiding and going around not coming in our communities because our communities are too dangerous or they they lack anything attractive or value, right? And then trying to also pursue them to a certain degree and do it with as much dialing down the holier than thou sort of dynamic, you know? But I do feel, I feel the, the tension when the community says all churches don't care or no one cares. I'm like, no, nah, you can't use the absolutes here. Like mama used to say, never say never. There's somebody out there that is actually going across the road, putting at risk some of their own vulnerabilities and so forth. And I rejoice in that again. That gives me hope. I, and I hope our stories offer that, offer that there. And again, I'll, I'll put Tammy on the spot here. I mean, you know, Tammy knows this. She, in the doctoral work I did, it was very pedestrian. I was like, I need to see living examples of people who have pressed through their own pain and they come out on the other side. And now they're, they're bringing that bomb of Gilead to the community. And at the heart of what we want to do is in as much compassionate love as Christians to acknowledge that there are people, whether they claim a Christian faith or not, that, that deeply care about their neighbors and are, and are attempting to do something about it. I love the language that you use there. And Reynolds, you referred to earlier of crossing the street and this idea that we should ask ourselves, what, what does that look like even during a pandemic to, to cross the street, to get proximate and engage with the stories of our neighbors? Because that, I think in this podcast that you guys have put on here, you've actually created a way for us to do that. It's not the only way, but it is a way, even in the midst of a pandemic, where you can metaphorically cross the street and to hear these stories and engage with these stories that might be different than your own. But that's, that's kind of the whole point. And then what are you going to do once you've done that? Once you've listened, what does that look like to move towards action? And so, Reynolds, I don't think we got a chance to hear from you on answering this idea of th this hope question of what gives you hope. I'd love to hear what gives you hope in this work and pivoting towards how our listeners can show up with this information after this conversation and really lean in to the discussion and be a part of the change. Yeah, I mean, I think that when you ask that question, it makes me feel kind of like I'm the teacher of the law in that story of the Samaritan, always trying to figure out how I can do the right thing, be a good neighbor. 
And I think what gives me hope is seeing the Samaritans. I think that we have the amazing gift of being able to hear stories of people like Yvonne and Miriam and Virginia Williams and Lafayette. I'm conscious of leaving other people out. I mean, I could name everybody who's been on the show, but these are the people who bring that transformation in my life that gives me a new sense of belonging in this place, Durham. You know, we we move about where we live in so many different ways and for so many reasons. And I think when we hear these amazing stories of people who have gone out of their way to love their neighbors, it gives us a new way of being a new way of being in the place that we live. And that's what we really hope to get out of it. So that's what gives me hope. That's so good. This is one of my favorite parts of our podcast is sort of this idea of how to show up. Like, how do we show up? How do we help our listeners do some practical things that can help them show up daily to make them better today than they were yesterday, right? Maybe make them more informed today than they were yesterday, more empathetic, more hopeful, whatever, than yesterday. That's growing. And I think that's key for all of us. And because you all offer this podcast, the first thing that I would like to obviously share with our listeners, I know Rob is sort of like, obviously they need to tune in, right? (laughs) They need to really add this to their list, start to subscribe, listen to the stories of the community, listen to their neighbors. Who's your neighbor? Find out. So that would be my challenge for the show up moment. Rob and I, as we walked into season two, I said that what's important for me and how I will continue to stay rooted in the Just podcast is that we have to stay hopeful and positive. It is hard. Keith just talked about, again, another shooting, again, another, again, another. It can just feel like you're walking in mud around this work. But I am committed to staying hopeful because I'm hoping that God will give me a lot of time on this planet and I refuse to be in a space of like fog around it. Clarity is important and understanding our purpose and mission and values in this work is really important and staying positive. When we think about the show up moment, I'd love for you to give our listeners something that they can really sink their teeth into, obviously listening to your podcast, but what else can they do to stay up, to stay encouraged and to stay moving forward in this work? Does anybody have anything of something to read, listen to, mantra, whatever, (laughs) but like, what could it be that how our listeners might be able to show up? I guess... (laughs) It is difficult to work and like Keith said, when you have these situations that are going on, you know, I think the the young man, the 15 year old that got killed the other day, I have a 15 year old grandson. So I guess (laughs) trying to help other people just understand for me, it's difficult. It's just difficult on a daily basis. I find... (laughs) All that I can offer is prayer. I am a praying person and my faith that we'll get through it. You know, I even got a tattoo a few years ago. We're going to be all right. You know, uh, <laughs> there's your mantra, Jess. There's your mantra. Yeah, she she really means it. There it is. I knew it would come through. I knew Kendrick it. Was. Lamar. He already. That's, been that's right. Work. That's right. We go. So I had to, I had to <laughs> recognize. <laughs> mm-hmm. Because otherwise you will, you will stay in a state of despair. You will not have hope. Like Keith said, you won't even want to get up in the morning. You'll want to to lock your kids and your grandkids up in the house and never let them go anywhere for fear that this sort of thing will happen, something will happen to them. And I refuse to allow that to happen. When it rises up in me, I know I have to go to the source of my creator because that's the only way I'll have peace. And the Lord gives me that peace and helps me to understand that I I'm strengthened in the fact, too, that I am a descendant of African slaves, and they survive far worse than what I've experienced. And so it helps me to look back at my ancestors, my grandparents, and see how they made it. And that encourages me to keep making it. And that's that's the only thing. That's all I got for people. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> you know? That's enough, yeah. So that's, that's what I have to offer people, faith. I just celebrated my A birthday. I'll just say A birthday on August 8th. And my family blessed me real good. You know, they got me a big old cake with Duke on it and everything. And I've been fortunate to live, as you say, Jess, I'm hopeful to have uh, another 
I don't know, a couple, three decades maybe of opportunity to learn and to grow and to be a better human being. I have two children. My son just moved out last week, and that's a, an amazing gift that he graduated from college this year and is now on his own. We're in a fellowship here in Durham. Um, my daughter, UNC Charlotte Jr., deciding to stay at home. Enough said. I got. We have children at at stake. Our you know our children are at stake. So and I was fortunate to be to be born in Washington D.C. and you know the nation's capital and be be nurtured by a black church community, First Baptist Church, Washington D.C. And I have a cloud of witnesses around me. Every day I feel like people are in the stands, even though we can't be in the stands for my beloved Duke Blue Devils. Sorry for any other sports fans out there. But that being said, some of y'all know my my story as being a collegiate athlete, and I know what it means to get hit. I know what it means to have to get back up. Even when you're tired, you don't want to. To run the race with endurance, as the scripture says, because there's there have been those who run before us and have been hit harder. Just to be real about it, I don't I don't like to often compare, you know, it's hard not to do that, compare our pain to someone else's who's been the most victimized. That doesn't get you very far. And so I wake up realizing that I still hear the cries of Emmett Till's mama. What is it like to go back through history and, and see how they made it over, you know? My grandma used to say, my soul would look back and wonder how I got over. Well, I know how you got over because you told us how you got over. You know, you got over by faith. You you said trust in, in God and hold in his unchanging hands. And, and, and again, some of these things become, if you haven't had people proximate enough to you to like be visible witnesses of that, it just becomes preached words. My heart breaks for folks who who it is just that. It's It's like it's only words. Well, words are what we have. So let's speak life. Let's speak hope. Also say what's real. You know, it's real out here. We need to we need to affirm our, our identity as black people and to say that we matter, not to the uh, disparagement of any other group. We feel like we embody every human humanity. If, if you study the movement and civil rights, I mean, the integrationist theory was like we all are interconnected in, in a garment of destiny. I mean, it, for me to affirm myself does not automatically exclude you if, unless you choose to exclude yourself, you know. But this takes training, too. I'm, I'm reminded again, you know, it's like choir rehearsal. It's like football practice. I mean, on game day, hopefully you're ready when the blitz comes. You're ready when something is thrown your way and that you don't overreact or you don't retaliate in ways that are outside of the, the rules of the game. And so, yeah, it's a lot for me. I'm trying to stir all of this up today because it, it takes more of that to get up each day when we, again, we see evidence that's contrary or we, again, see our vulnerability and our fragility as human beings. I'm, I'm going to stop here after I tell this bit, but the other day, so I, I like to ride my cycle, road cycle with a friend of mine who's got me doing this more than I probably would have under normal circumstances because, you know, the risks are what they are when you're on the road. But the other day we were coming up to a stop sign on a major back road here in Durham. And so we pulled over, you know, towards the middle of the street because like, we're coming to a stop sign, but there's this big pickup truck coming behind us. And it's clear that the person is frustrated that we're moving to the center of the lane. But again, we're coming to a stop sign. So you got to stop anyway. But this person decides to yell out of the window, you know, get the out the road. I take my deep breath and I keep going. And I'm like, OK, God, thank you that I don't yell back what, what wants to come out of me to this person. And quickly, it's a racialized incident, you know, in my mind. I'm like, man, do I continue to ride or not? Right. But these are the people say microaggressions or whatever aggressions. That's maybe more overt. But um, yeah, I appreciate the chance to reflect with you all this morning as we try to navigate these very difficult times because there is a roller coaster ride, and any moment can be can be fatal or can be life giving depending on what we choose to do or not to do. Reynolds, before we let you guys go, would you like to share briefly one of the things I think Jess alluded to earlier? This key program that Durham Cares has built over the years of the pilgrimage of pain and hope. From a practical standpoint, how can people engage with the pilgrimage to learn the story of their community, participate, and also to support that work? Because I know right now you're, you're pivoting that programming to make it available amidst the pandemic when normal gatherings are difficult. So could you just speak to that maybe and point people to where they could go to learn more about getting involved? Sure. So the pilgrimage really has emphasized over the last four years the importance of getting your feet on the ground, being in these places in the city, hearing from the stories, looking people in the eye and hearing them tell their stories. We can't do that right now because we're social distancing from each other. So we've canceled all our pilgrimages for the year. But there's such an important framework to the pilgrimage that emphasizes place and reflection and stories and transformation. And so what we're doing is taking those values of the pilgrimage and trying to create something that can help people learn more about their city, more about the story of race and class and colonialism, 
particularly in their own city. You know, a lot of these conversations are abstracted and we want people to kind of learn what is this, why does this matter in our own city? So we are creating a video series curriculum that will take people on this pilgrimage journey throughout the city through a series of videos and an accompanying curriculum where there are small groups, community groups, organizations can kind of go on a eight to 10 week journey where they watch videos, reflect, and it's really kind of deeply centered on the story of Durham. So we have just started the process of creating that and we are really excited about it. And one way that people can be a part of this is just go to our website and you'll learn more about it. We are trying to raise support for it right now I think even more than just financial support, we want people to spread the word about this because there's so many different groups that can use this. Yeah, I think it's going to be something that is really important. And the website would be www.durhamcares.org? That's right. Mm -hmm. Where they can learn more. Okay, so www.durhamcares.org to learn more about Pilgrimage of Pain and Hope, what it looks like right now. You guys talked about the importance of storytelling and being in tune about the story of your community and your city and how that intersects with your story, how it intersects with God's story, right? And I think that as you think about that, I would encourage our listeners to lean in to that opportunity to get proximate to the story of your community and and how your story intersects with that story. Check out their website, learn more about the pilgrimage, how you can participate, support it as they take this virtual to be able to reach even more people and even position Durham Cares to potentially even take this uh, beyond the geographic boundaries of Durham, right? Because the last time we spoke, Reynolds, you're in talks with people potentially doing this in Raleigh. The importance of story and knowing the story of a community isn't limited to if you live in Durham. Everyone needs to practice that. And I think the principles that you guys are addressing apply well beyond the zip code of Durham County. Yeah. Reynolds, Keith, Tammy, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today and just leaning in to this. This was, this was a blessing to be a part of this conversation. I think that that even that title of, of pain and hope felt like that was, that was the theme of this conversation because we didn't shy away from painful things. And yet I just feel deeply the, in, the infusion of hope as a backdrop against everything that you're sharing. And I believe our listeners will pick up on that as well. So thank you for, for doing what you do and just appreciate the time. All right. Thanks. thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. Y'all take care. Jess, that, there was a lot going on there, right? So much to unpack. What stood out to you when it comes to that interview? What rose to the surface? So what stood out to me is that you can't isolate your own experience while you try to support and educate and lean into another Your lived experience is your lived experience and it's going to come through regardless. Purpose of our podcast was to help inform and get people sort of understanding this other opportunity for our listeners to plug into who's my neighbor. And while we were promoting essentially that podcast, because it's a perfect complement to the work that we're doing with Just, we heard the stories of the hosts. It was like art imitating life imitating... (laughs) Yeah, art yeah, there's, there's in layers. the podcast. The layers. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. And for our listeners, God bless your patience with me because when, when Rob asks me to synthesize my thoughts, it can take forever because I actually literally do it out loud. Well, to your credit, you're synthesizing three stories simultaneously on a dime. So thank you, Rob. I appreciate your grace. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I do think that's that was the first thing that came out was that, you know, Keith was so so brutally honest about his own story about Mm. him riding his bike and what that felt like to him and the most recent shooting and just there's just so and then locally Durham right now in Durham at this current time there there are a lot of shootings and so it's just Mm. feeling like how do you rise above the noise but you have to pay honor to the noise because the noise is the issue that we're trying to really focus on around just and justice it was an interesting conversation, I think. And I really appreciate their their sincere effort to bring voices forward. Mm. I love storytelling. Mm. So I get excited about the idea of storytelling, even if the story is painful. I love people's experience. And so I love that they're doing this and the way in which they're doing it. And I think our listeners will really enjoy spending some time with Who's My Neighbor. I think it'll really help close some loops on the work that we do with Just. 
My takeaways, I think, are very similar to yours in that what I love about the work that Reynolds, Tammy, and, and Keith do with Durham Cares is that it's story-driven and learning people's stories makes it it's highly relational. It is highly relational work, the work that they do. At the end of the day, relationships are messy. I mean, they don't run a think tank. This isn't just abstract and, and kind of separated from the human experience. I mean, they, they are, you mentioned earlier, it feels like walking through mud. They don't shy away from that mess because mud is messy, right? And they are trudging forward with hope. They kind of, they know their why and they're anchored in it and they own it. But they also, they love people. There's a deep love of people yeah. and there's a deep love of recognizing the humanity in others. And yeah. you can hear that come through, and, and especially with Tammy and, and Keith's stories of in the midst of incredible adversity, pushing forward to love neighbor, even when that is messy and even when your neighbor isn't being loving to you. The love of enemy, trying to understand people's stories that when they're not even maybe recognizing the humanity in you and you trying to do that to them is really inspiring and I think this this concept of what Tammy said of learning to be a neighbor to the last person you would ever consider learning from, that cuts both ways, whatever that means. Like whoever our listener is, that can apply to you and challenge you. Now, I know it challenges me, right? Whoever you would define as the last person you'd ever consider learning from has a lesson to teach you. And how do we learn to be a neighbor to that person? That's a difficult question. And I think we'd rather the answer be more cookie cutter. We'd rather it be stay in our lane because honestly, Jess, we don't want to cross the street. Yeah. But they were challenging us to consider what does it look like to cross the street? I think what gives them hope is seeing the Samaritans. And ironically, you know, you can tie in a Mr. Rogers quote here, Mr. Rogers neighborhood talking about being a good neighbor. And that this famous quote of look for the helpers when things are difficult in the midst of tragedy or chaos or a pandemic, look for the helpers because you'll always find people who are helping. Yeah. He built his whole entire spiel, right? And his whole entire legacy on kind of that notion that they're tapping into of they're inspired because they've they've seen the helpers and you'll always find people who are helping that can be a model to us in this work. Yeah, that's it. That's it. It was it was great. You're right on. I love that look for the helpers. Cross the street, be that good Samaritan. It sort of gets to the heart of the matter when we talk about what's your show up moment. Maybe it is... Think about the person that you would be least likely who's at the end of that chain. How do you hold space for their story and hold space for yourself to listen and learn from it? That does give me hope. I mean, think about how we move forward and how we can use that as an exercise to recognize each other's humanity, right? And and the dignity that comes with that. That's going to be tested in, in the months ahead, right? As we seek to recover from this pandemic, as we seek to address inequality and injustice, but do so in a way that is going to require us coming out of our, of our lanes, it's going to require us to cross the street, cross the aisle, if you will, if you want to borrow a political analogy, right? And that's... We're going into that season. There we go. There, there's really no avoiding it. That, that train, right? It doesn't just come by your house, Jess. That train's coming. That train's coming for everybody. <laughs> there's no stopping it. I appreciated this. This was a really, a real, I love it. And we were able to do an interview with three folks. <laughs> so we're going to end on a light note. We managed the logistics of a very thoughtful and relevant and timely conversation with three just incredible community leaders. We did. So check out their work, durhamcares.org. Learn more, lean in, lean into the story of your community, lean into your own story and lean into the story of that, of that last person down the chain or that last stop. Cause we're, we're kind of hitting the train analogy pretty hard right now. So yeah, that, that last stop. Last uh, stop. That's good. It works. It, was it works. It works. I, I got no, I, there's, it's all downhill from here for me. So I got to stop while I'm ahead. Let's just, let's just cut until next time. Right. Until next time. Thanks. Friends. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening to just in the spirit of sharing. If you like what you've heard, tell a friend about the show and give us a five-star rating and review. Many thanks to DJ P dog and producer low key for producing the music for our show. Subscribe on Apple podcasts, Google podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening. Here's a preview of our next show. I'm just a naive guy from Durham who thought that, you know, you're supposed to do the right things. Racism was this whole systemic effort to dominate a people. It's a messy toolkit, man, but it works. My work on racism, my conversation around racism, all of this is the residual of me being present.